Um, so I want to just welcome everybody to our virtual program tonight. Um, it's one of the first of the programs that we're doing in conjunction with our three new exhibitions that we have at the museum. Uh, we were very excited to open our new exhibitions last Friday. Um, Jared Ragland and Carrie Norton's Where You Come From is Gone, as well as Leonard Baskin's uh, Native American Portraits. Um, while we were working on putting together these shows, um, we decided to incorporate um, alongside those two exhibitions works from Native artists that were in our collection as well as in the collections of St. Petersburg College's foundation. And in doing so, we were able to sort of explore the collections a little bit more and find out about some of the artists in these collections that we didn't have too much about in our files. One of the artists whose work is on view currently is um, an artist by the name of Richard Hunt. And we're gonna talk a little bit about him tonight um, and particularly how um, he is tied to this very famous silent film uh, in the land of war canoes, previously known as a film called In the Land of Headhunters. And this was a film uh, put together by Edward Curtis at the turn of the uh, 20th century. Tonight we're going to take a look at a little bit about the history of this film, why it was important, why it continues to be important, and its impact and influence on contemporary Native American arts. Okay. So some of you might already know, but Edward Curtis, um, very famous American photographer, um, and who was sort of a self-taught and self-appointed ethnologist, um, was mainly known for his work capturing the American West and Native American peoples throughout the United States. Um, he was born in 1868 and died in 1952 and produced uh, thousands of works of art throughout his lifetime. In 1887, when he was just 19 years old, his family moved from the Midwest to uh, Seattle, Washington. There he became a photography partner with a man named Thomas Guptill and established a studio known as the Curtis and Guptill Photographers and Photo Engravers. It was there in Seattle that Curtis first met and photographed this woman who was known as Princess Angeline. Um, she was uh, also known by her native name, which was Kiksomolo, who and she was the daughter of Chief Self of Seattle. This was the very first portrait that, um, that Curtis took of a Native American, and it really sort of instilled in him or ignited this sort of obsession with collecting images of these quote unquote sort of disappearing peoples. That idea, that whole concept of sort of using photography as a way of collecting people and culture was really rooted in the idea of salvage anthropology that was very popular at this time. Um, the idea being that you had to sort of capture the last bits, the last vestiges of these vanishing societies. So, just a few years after he opened this studio, he was out photographing Mount Rainier, which you can see on the right. Um, while he was doing that, um, he, oh, well, I'm sorry, let me go back. Uh, he came upon a small group of scientists who were lost and they were asking for directions. And um, one of those was George Bird Grinnell, who was considered an expert on Native Americans at the time. Um, because of this connection that he made, simply stumbling across these folks who needed some directions on the side of Mount Rainier, um, Curtis became the official photographer of Grinnell's next expedition, which was the Harriman Alaska Expedition of 1899. Um, having very little in terms of formal education, Curtis really learned a lot throughout the lectures that were given aboard the ship each evening of the voyage. Grinnell would come out on deck and give a big sort of lecture about where they were going and the folks who lived there and why they were going um, to document them. And Curtis really took this all to heart. Grinnell became very interested in Curtis's photography skills on that journey. 
and invited him to join him on his next expedition, which was to photograph people of the Blackfoot Confederacy in Montana in 1900, which is where this photograph comes from. But most famously, in 1906, J.P. Morgan provided uh, Edward Curtis with $75,000 to produce a series on Native Americans. This work was to be 20 volumes total with over 1,500 photographs. Morgan's funds were to be dispersed over a five-year period and were earmarked to support only field work for the books, not for writing, not for editing, or even the production of the volumes. Curtis received absolutely no salary for this project that he undertook, which ended up lasting more than 20 years. Under the terms of the agreement, uh, Morgan received 25 sets and 500 original prints um, as sort of repayment for his $75,000. Once Curtis had secured funding, additional funding for his projects, he was able to hire several employees to help him. For writing and recording Native American languages, he hired a former journalist by the name of William Myers. For assistance with logistics and field work, he hired Bill Phillips. But perhaps the most important hire for the success of his project was Frederick Webb Hodge, who was an anthropologist um, who was at the time um, working at the Smithsonian Institution and had researched Native American peoples of the Southwest. Hodge was hired to edit the entire series but he also provided links to a lot of other folks, um, sort of advisors as they traveled throughout the country. Eventually, Curtis produced 222 complete sets of his work um, with the goal not just to photograph, but document as much of Native American traditional life as possible before, quote unquote, this way of life disappeared from the planet. He wrote in the introduction to his first volume in 1907, that the information that is to be gathered respecting the mode of life of one of the greatest races of mankind must be collected at once or the opportunity will be lost. So again, getting back to that idea of sort of that salvage anthropology, collecting what's disappearing. Curtis made over 10,000 wax cylinder recordings of Native American languages and music. He took over 40,000 photographic images of members of over 80 tribes recorded tribal lore and history, and described traditional foods, housing, garments, recreation, ceremonies, and funeral customs. He wrote biographical sketches of tribal leaders, and his materials, in so many cases, um, are the only written recorded history that we have of many of these tribes. So his work has become incredibly important um, beyond the scope, I think, that he originally saw. In this two decades long endeavor, um, Curtis used many instruments to capture images, including the motion picture camera. When he arrived into the Northwest Coast region, he partnered with the man you see on the right, George Hunt. Hunt was the son of a Hudson's Bay Company official and was a noble uh, and the son of a noble Tlingit woman. Um, the Tlingit were a native group located in the Northwest region. He was raised in Fort Rupert and worked for the Jessup North Pacific Expedition for the American Museum of Natural History, and he served as an advisor for Edward Curtis dealing with the peoples known as the Kwakwakawak. At the time Curtis was working with them, they were known as the Kwakutl, um, but that was sort of the Americanized version of their name, which is truly the Kwakwakawak um, tribe. The partnership that Edward Curtis and George Hunt had um, and the sheer visuals of the Pacific Northwest Coast really led Curtis to want to make a silent film about them. So Curtis and Hunt decided to create a feature film depicting this vanishing uh, Native American life, partly as a way, of course, to improve their finances, but also because film technology had improved to such an extent they could create a 40 minute long film. Curtis chose to focus his film on this Kwakwakawak tribe, um, uh, which is located in the Queen Charlotte Straits region in the central coast of British Columbia. His film, which was entitled In the Land of Headhunters, was the first feature length film whose cast was composed entirely of native North Americans. 
The film premiered simultaneously at the Casino Theater in New York and the Moore Theater in Seattle on December 7th of 1914. The silent film was accompanied by a score composed by John Brams, a musical theater composer who had worked with Gilbert and Sullivan. And the film received rave reviews from critics, but it really only made a little over $3,000 in its initial run. The following plot synopsis was published in conjunction with a 1915 showing of the film at Carnegie Hall. To gain power from the spirit forces, Motana, a great chief's son, goes on a vigil journey, but through the tribal law forbids the thought of woman during the fast, his dreams are ever of Nida, her face appearing in the coiling smoke of a prayer fire he builds high upon a mountain peak. To uh, foretend the anger of the spirits, he must pass a stronger ordeal. He has to sleep on the island of the dead, then hunt and kill a whale, and raid the clustered sea lion rookeries, a whole day's paddle out to sea. Nida is wooed and won by Motana, and splendid is the wooing. But Nida, with her dowry, is coveted by the evil sorcerer. The sorcerer is the figure you see in the center image in this slide. He is evil, old, and ugly. Watcat, Nida's father, fear, fears the baleful medicine of the sorcerer and also stands in dread of his brother, the short life bringer and headhunting scourge of all of the coast. Wacket promises Nida to the sorcerer instead of Motana. So ensues war between the two. So it's sort of a star-crossed lovers story um, of two families um, battling over the princess. Um, and um, it, it's a completely fictionalized story, obviously. So despite this sort of critical acclaim, because it's quite a beautiful film, the film was panned by ethno ethnographic and anthropological communities, as well as the Native American communities, because it was viewed as simply being inauthentic. The film combines many accurate representations, however, of aspects of Kwakwakawak culture, art, and technology from the era in which it was made with this melodramatic plot based on practices that either dated from long before the first contact with Europeans or were completely fictional. Curtis never um, specifically presented the film as a documentary, but he also made very careful to never say that it was a work of fiction. Um, so some aspects of the film do have documentary accuracy, the artwork, the ceremonial dances, the clothing, the architecture of the buildings and the construction of the canoes reflected Kwakwakawa culture, but it reflected this culture that had already sort of begun to wane by the time that Curtis was there because of colonial forces. Other aspects of the film were based on orally transmitted traditions or aspects in other neighboring clans. For instance, in the film, there's a big whale hunt, but the Kwakwakawak never hunted whales, neighboring tribes did. So it's sort of a pastiche of many different tribal customs in the Northwest coast. Um, the film does accurately portray Kwakwakawak rituals that were at the time prohibited by Canada's potlatch prohibition, which was enacted in 1884 and not rescinded until the 1950s. The most sensational elements of the film, the head hunting, sorcery, and the handling of human remains were pretty much completely fictionalized. Um, some activities uh, like we mentioned, were borrowed. But overall, the film offers us splendid visuals and sort of sketchy anthropological or ethnographic um, material. Today, rather than viewing the film as documenting Native American life at the turn of the century, we should view Curtis's film as documenting a moment of cultural encounter between Curtis and the Native peoples performing a scripted version of Native American histories of the region for the camera. The clothing, art, and ceremonies depicted in the film were all clearly recalled and reproduced for the film, 
but had been in waning use for over a decade. So let's take a quick moment to see sort of why these things were moving out of fashion and how come it was very important this film sort of brought them back. Because that's really integral to understanding how an object in our collection on view now was really inspired by this film. In 1849, the British Crown granted the Hudson's Bay Company a royal charter for the colony of Vancouver Island. And the Crown charged the company with encouraging and promoting settlement. So settlers began arriving in large numbers, much to the chagrin of the native groups. In 1852, uh, the Haida, another native tribe in the area, were able to drive away gold miners. Um, and in 1857, the Thompson River peoples were able to do the same. But foreigners could simply not be held back from these lands. And by 1858, huge numbers of gold seekers had arrived in British Columbia bringing an end to the sort of better relationship era of the fur trade and opening an area of settlement that permanently shifted the power balance and ultimately turned the First Nations peoples um, of their region into minorities in their own land. In 1881, the native population of British Columbia was approximately 26,000 and there were about 24,000 settlers. But by 1901, British Columbia had a total population of over 178,000, and there were just under 20,000 Native Americans. So during the last decades of the 19th century, both the US and Canadian official government policies towards Aboriginal peoples was assimilation. The Northwest Coast people posed special problems to these assimilationists because the, the tribes in the Northwest Coast region were really hierarchically organized and um, they had keen sense of property um, and devoted considerable time and effort to accumulating wealth, not to save it, but to share it with one another and to take care of their communities. Officials and missionaries firmly believed that what they judged to be senseless sort of extravagances um, were had to be eradicated before the Northwest Coast groups could be called civilized beings. And so as a result in 1884, um, the Canadian government banned the potlatch and related dances. The potlatch was a really sort of opulent feast and dancing ceremony oftentimes many days long that um, in which village and community leaders would sort of share their wealth and enhance their position in social hierarchy um, and perpetuate artistic practices. So the potlatch is where we used to see all the sort of ceremonial masks and dancing and music and chanting, um, as well as all the big feasting. It was the single most important ceremony in many of the cultures of the Northwest Coast. So in other words, when the British uh, colonists came in, in addition to taking the native lands, reducing native ability to maintain a subsistence economy and endorsing racist attitudes, the government criminalized ceremonies that were really central to identity and culture in the Northwest Coast. The Kwakwakawak, whom Curtis focused his film efforts on, were considered to be the most quote unquote incorrigible tribe by the Canadian authorities during this time. They persisted in giving away enormous quantities of goods and continued performing ceremonies like the potlatch. When Canadian authorities um, began to enforce the anti potlatch law, the Kwakwakawak designated, they sort of designed um, various subterfuges to avoid the law. Sometimes they would hold potlatches in remote villages in the middle of winter when the police had difficulty traveling and couldn't get to them. Sometimes they would have them on Christmas insisting, oh, we're just giving away Christmas gifts. And sometimes they would give immense sacks of flour or sugar and bo bo boxes of biscuits and cookies and crackers claiming they were, oh, we're just providing food for our neighbors. So because they continued to potlatch, they continued to need 
all of the art that went along with it. While most Northwest Coast groups abandoned most of their traditional works by the end of the 19th century, uh, not willingly, of course, uh, the Kwakwakawak continued to make art that was, if anything, perhaps more lavish and Baroque than their earlier pieces had been. Whereas before they had erected relatively few totem poles, in the first decade of the 20th century, poles like the ones you see here at Alert Bay began to proliferate. The poles were meaningless without the potlatch that validated their erection. And so having all of these totem poles sort of springing up, even though potlatches were outlawed, signified a really sort of ostentatious disregard for Canadian law and were visual expressions of the resistance to white authority by the Kwakwakawak. So when Edward Curtis came to town to film this sort of quote unquote traditional culture, the Kwakwakawak found the project really important for themselves for the film production allowed them to experience their full culture, cultural lives sort of free from this colonial control. They were allowed to create in public without fear of, of sort of the repercussions that create these beautiful totem poles and costumes, um, have these dances, perform these songs. And so it was a big, fantastic thing for, for the tribe to be able to do. An extension of their previous engagement with um, in international expositions, um, ethnographers and museums, the film really helped the Kwakwakawak sort of evade this potlatching ban and maintain their expressive culture and emerge on the other side as sort of um, actors on the world's stage. By adapting their traditional ceremonies for the film, um, while refusing to play the sort of stereotypical Indians of the plains, the Kwakwakawak played a really vital role in the development of the most modern of commercial art forms, which is the motion picture. Like his photograph, Curtis's film was originally meant to capture a quote unquote vanishing race, but instead, when resituated within the history of motion pictures and framed by modern Kwakwakawak perspectives, this landmark of early cinema can be recast as sort of this visible evidence of ongoing cultural survival and transformation under these shifting historical conditions. For nearly a century and counting, um, the land of the headhunters has constituted this sort of lens through which we can reframe and reimagine changing terms of colonial representation, cultural memory, and um, intercultural encounters. The film provided some of the most unforgettable images of Kwakwakawak ceremonial life. Now, you can watch the entire silent film on YouTube. It is, it is in the public domain now. I'm going to play us just a little clip from it tonight, um, but you can go on YouTube and watch it yourself. It's about 40 minutes long. Um, we do also screen it every day around 2 p.m. at the museum. Um, so you can also come and, and view it in the galleries of the museum um, while we have these exhibitions on view. So I'm gonna play us a little clip um, from the film and it's one of the most sort of unforgettable images of the film. In this scene, we're going to see um, the war canoes approaching land carrying three costumed and masked dancers. Um, one of the dancers is the wasp, one of the dancers is the thunderbird, and the third dancer is the bear. They're really dramatically sort of waving their arms and swaying their bodies. They're dancing in the prows of these war canoes. And this image really captured the imagination of the world and gave us a really great idea of how these, how these costumes that we saw in museums already at this time would look as they were being used. So I'm going to go ahead and play and get us to uh, this moment, which is right here. So as you can see, it is a silent film. Um, and um, it's, it's really quite amazing to watch. If you get the opportunity, you can, as I said, view this online. But here we see instances of these canoes, which were long out of fashion, 
the Kwakwakawak were able to carve them and paint them and take part in this communal sort of creation of the art here. Um, they were able to create these costumes and wear these costumes and perform in them in public without fear of repercussions for the first time in, in nearly 40, 40 years by the time this film came out. Um, so it's a, it's a really fantastic thing for us to be able to have and to see. All right, I'm going to go ahead and, and keep moving on with this because it is a silent film. Um, you can sort of get the, the, the full effect of it um, when you're watching it in clips as well as thematically. Um, another distinctive image uh, throughout the film shows a large group of masked dancers. Um, you can see this still image on the right who appear when a curtain is suddenly dropped even though the village, which in reality was only a row of false fronts that were created for the film, um, it, it's still an impressive view. A tall frontal totem pole, similar to ones from Alert Bay, um, has at, a, at its bottom a raven with a projecting beak, which is normally closed. Here, the beak opens when people enter the house. That's what you see happening in this image at the right. The beak opens and you have to crawl through and you can see this, this one person's already crawling through, their leg is hanging out here. You crawl through, so the beak opens and closes. And it's a really stunning image in the film. Within this roofless house, which consisted of just sides and a rear wall, stood two large house posts carved by artist Charlie James. Because Curtis used the same set for different houses, he needed to alter the look of interiors and did that by simply removing wings off house posts and adding beaks. So they became these posts with interchangeable facial features. The posts ultimately made their way to Stanley Park in Vancouver and were there for almost 75 years until they were removed due to deterioration. Um, but they were later copied and um, by contemporary artists and became very important um, to sort of giving us an idea of what art looked like at the time and informing contemporary carvers. Soon after the movie's release, it sort of disappeared from the world of cinema and was forgotten. In the late 1940s, a damaged copy of the film was found in a trash can and given to the film, to the film uh, Field Museum in Chicago by a collector of old movies. In the 1960s, George Quimby, director of the Burke Museum at the University of Washington in Seattle, collaborated with a fellow curator, artist, and Northwest Coast native, uh, Bill Holm, to restore the film. Holm brought the film back to the Kwakwakawak in Fort Rupert, where it was filmed. Some of the people he encountered were descendants of the actors. And he worked with them and with the contemporary Kwakwakawak people to make a soundtrack of the speeches and the songs. That film was released in 1967 under the new name In the Land of War Canoes. And it's now recognized as a classic in its genre. The film was selected in 1999 for preservation in the US National Film Registry at the Library of Congress because it's culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. It was, after all, the first feature-length film whose cast was composed entirely of Native Americans. The second was made only eight years later. That's Robert Flaherty's Nanook of the North. Most of the film was shot on Deer Island, just uh, near Fort Rupert, British Columbia. And it was the first feature film made in British Columbia and is the oldest surviving feature film made in Canada. So today, when we discuss the film, we're really looking at all of the art that was created to create this film. Um, the, uh, we can discuss how the film really helped to perpetuate artistic traditions for the Kwak Kwak Walk and how this has in turn impacted contemporary folks. One of the artists who worked on creating um, some of the pieces seen in Curtis's film is this man on the left, whose name was Mungo Martin. 
Martin was born in 1879 in Fort Rupert um, to parents of the Kwakwakawak Nation. He was the son of a high ranking native um, and as a young man participated in Curtis's filming and continued to create carvings, including totem poles throughout his life. In 1949, the University of British Columbia purchased several old Kwakwakawak poles, house posts, and even a frame, a house frame, um, but they all needed to be restored and repaired. And so they contacted Martin to do the restoration and repairs on these. So from 1949 to 1951, Mungo Martin was the artist in residence at the museum, restoring his 1900s um, totem pole that he had created for Curtis's film and carving two new poles with his own family's crests. In 1951, um, the, these were erected on a three acre site on the University of British Columbia campus called Thunderbird Park. Mungo's daughter, Helen, married the gentleman you see on the right, whose name is Henry Hunt. Henry was born in 1923 in the Kwakwakawak community of Fort Rupert. And if the last name Hunt sounds vaguely familiar, it's because he was also the descendant of George Hunt, the ethnologist who worked on Curtis's film. In 1954, um, Henry, who you see here, went to work with his father-in-law, Mungo Martin, the carver, at the Thunderbird Park in British Columbia. He became the chief assistant. He studied traditional wood carvings under Mungo Martin and worked in the museum's collections, helping to restore and preserve Aboriginal art. When Mungo Martin died in 1962, um, Henry Hunt, became uh, the master carver at the park and continued his traditions. As the spirit of liberation and so social equality sort of pervaded the US and Canada in the 60s and 70s, more and more non-natives recognized the value of contemporary Native American art. The market for Northwest Coast art in particular exploded and large numbers of Native artists flourished during this period. Contemporary Native American artists have a sort of historic consciousness of um, the traditions of their predecessors, but they're fully aware of living in an immensely different world. Over the last several decades, Native Americans and Canadian First Nations peoples have become incre increasingly empowered, promoting both self-determination and cultural pride. A consequence of this large scale shift in public attitudes towards native peoples was a tremendous upsurge in the interest in art and dramatic increases in its production. Henry Hunt, um, who, we, who we just saw here, Henry Hunt trained his sons. He had three sons, Tony, Stanley, and Richard. And the gentleman you see in both of these images is Richard Hunt. Um, he was trained in carving by his father and um, became a, a master carver at the Thunderbird Park pro program in 1974. Um, he, uh, he worked in the park um, for many years before he left to become an independent artist. Richard Hunt is an Aboriginal artist from the Kwakwakawa Nation of coastal British Columbia. He comes from this family of internationally acclaimed native artists with ties stretching all the way back directly to Curtis's film, both as actors and as advisors on the film. He is um, a very popular artist, continues to produce today. And if you come to the museum, we have his totem, one of his totem poles on view now um, in our galleries. Born in 1951, Richard um, is from Alert Bay, but has lived most of his life in Victoria. He began carving with his father at the age of 13 um, and became the chief carver at Thunderbird Park in 1974. Um, but in 1986, he launched his new career as a freelance sort of Aboriginal artist. His native name is Guila Yogue La Guilis, which is a highly appropriate name uh, it translates directly to a man that travels and wherever he goes, he potlatches. 
Through his art, his speaking and his dancing, Richard has indeed given much to the world. Some artists, uh, some contemporary native artists have uh, chosen to create new interpretations of traditional artworks that were used in ceremonies that are either continuations of unbroken traditions such as pot latching or new forms um, such as uh, the Rainbow Creek Dancers, which is a group that performs new and original songs and dances. Um, this is a, a, a a mask, a, an articulated mask that was created by Richard Hunt. So same artist that we have on view now. And it's meant to be worn sort of perched on the top of the head and it's manipulated um, by these Rainbow Creek dancers as they, as they move. And there's strings that are attached to open and close the jaw and to also move the dorsal fins and the side fins. So it can be completely manipulated while it's being worn. Um, it was originally created for the Rainbow Creek Dancers, and um, it was exhibited in a legacy exhibition at the Royal British Columbia Museum. It was inspired by one of the traditional masks, um, but the, the parts of this mask that can be manipulated today and its sort of exaggerated form line design that it uses are the newer sort of interpretations of traditional art that contemporary artists are using today. To satisfy the desire of buyers for relatively inexpensive Northwest Coast two-dimensional art, artists from the 60s onward have worked in um, serigraphy, which is a printmaking medium, um, as well as lithography and other, and other printmaking techniques. Um, Richard Hunt primarily works nowadays in this 2D form, um, but these Northwest Coast images sort of lend themselves nicely to two-dimensional um, depictions with these sort of heavy um, form lines, as we call them. Um, Kwak Waka Waka artist Henry Speck, whose work you see here, um, he produced unlimited edition uh, prints of mythological beings, and other artists followed suit soon after him. By 1980, approximately 100 artists had published more than 900 different images. You can find galleries all over the world, but of course in Seattle, Vancouver, Victoria, and elsewhere that sell prints and um, many Native American entrepreneurs have opened up their own galleries as well. Um, one of these prints um, is by a neutral nooth artist, which is another neighboring tribe to the Kwak Waka Waka. And in the neutral nooth winter dances, Pukubs, which you see here, are spirits of a drowned whale hunter. They appear in the form of a dancer with a white painted body and a white mask with deep wrinkles. Sort of, you think about being submerged in the water for a long time and how you get pruney. That's sort of what those deep wrinkles are meant to convey. So you can understand this is a drowned spirit. Here, um, here the artist uh, Henry Thompson has translated this being into two dimensions in a print with the kind of sort of asymmetry and open spaces that were traditional in Native American and Northwest Coast art. Um, but here it's, it's translated into this two dimensional form. Although most native prints are made for the art market, some are created specifically for pot latches and distributed to, to the guests as sort of their, their gifts. Other artists have experimented with entirely new media, such as glass. Um, Preston Singletary, the artist you see in the upright corner, draws from his Tlingit heritage and applies classic form line designs onto his glass sculptures some of which assume the forms of the traditional types of garments like the conical painted hats. Um, Singletary works and teaches at the Pilchuk Glass School and has been really instrumental in fostering the use of this medium among native artists. But he was really influenced in his studies by the sculptures at Thunderbird Park. So again, we see this artist who's working in a glass medium, who's of a, a neighboring, a neighboring native tribe, the Tlingit, was really influenced by the art that he saw on public display for public consumption in um, Thunderbird Park, the work that was done by Mungo Martin 
and Henry Hunt, um, again, sort of tying us directly back to the Edward Curtis film. At the end of the 19th century, it was really thought that Northwest Coast culture was vanishing and needed to be preserved in museum collections and by means of ethnographic texts that described these sort of pre-contact cultures. At the beginning of the 20th century, it was thought that native people who had not died of disease would become assimilated into the dominant society. And um, we saw Curtis's film as part of this collecting practice of of salvage anthropology. In the middle of the 20th century, it was thought that the form line style of the North had been lost forever and that um, lost skills like basket weaving and clothing weaving were, were abundant throughout the tribes. But none of this has come to pass. Northwest Coast culture remains alive. Northwest Coast Native peoples maintain a strong sense of identity and Northwest Coast art continues to be produced in larger and larger amounts. The transformation of sacred objects into personal artistic expression in the pieces that we've looked at as contemporary artists are just a few small examples of this ongoing vitality of this great artistic tradition and of the strength and endurance of a proud and vibrant people. And we can thank in large part the artist's work in the completion of Edward Curtis's film for continuing these traditions in many of our young artists today. And so that sort of brings us to a conclusion for our presentation tonight. I do hope that you can come and see this beautiful work that we have from Richard Hunt on view. We also have, as you can see right next to it, um, a 2D print on view from another native artist. And we have a few other pieces from both our collections and the collections of the SPC Foundation on view um, that show you some contemporary examples of Native American art today. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I, I'd like to ask Teresa um, how long you'll have these on display at Leap Ratner. All of these pieces will be on view through May 16th. May 16th. Mm -hmm. We are working on getting the Leonard Baskin Native American portrait prints, as mm -hmm. well as the um, contemporary uh, Native American artist pieces that belong to us and the foundation. We're working on getting those pieces um, on view in our online collections. So those should be available online for viewing in the next week. Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Great question, Anita. <laughs> Any other questions from anyone? Well, comment. I love the Leah with the, uh, I guess that was a picture by Curtis, the, the woman with the, the yes, hair so down to the a, side. It's and actually we had a comment in our chat um, from, from Dr. Hubbard. It is a, a Hopi woman. Um, one of the images that Curtis took um, and it, he has um, these, these new sort of publications talking about um, sort of the continuation of, of Native peoples. Um, that's a great sort of split shot where they've merged it with Princess Leia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very um, striking. Yeah. I would, I would like to know why you didn't borrow some of my art to hang up. I have <laughs> masks and rattled and all of this Northwest art as well as my wedding band is an eagle. It's well, a that's pretty amazing. Um, I did not know that you had a very large collection, um, but uh, these these are just uh, works that are sort of in our collections um, that we thought would sort of complement the exhibitions that we, the larger exhibitions that we have on view. But you're always welcome to borrow it. I have in addition, a huge collection of oceanic art from Papua New Guinea. Oh, wow. Well, thank you very much. That's an incredibly gracious offer from you. I'm sure we're going to take you up on it. <laughs> well, I hope so, because it's more than my children will ever want. Well, that sounds like you and I need to have a good long conversation. <laughs> any, any time. 
Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining in our in our program tonight. No, it's wonderful. I've seen part of the film at one of the museums in uh, British Columbia. Uh, I think it was somewhere further north. It was a, it may have been the town where Curtis filmed because they still have totem poles there. But somewhere, I've been to so many and so many galleries that I can't remember exactly where. And I've seen a great many of the photographs at in the Seattle Art Museum. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you're you're abs you're correct in that in the town of Alert Bay where they filmed um, where they filmed uh, Curtis's work. They they do still have many of the totem poles on view. They've been restored and repainted over time, um, but many of them are still there. Yeah. Um, I, I see we have a question in our chat about any CD sales in our store. We don't have any copies. We don't have any um, CDs for sale in our store. Um, you can go online to the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress does have um, some of the copies of the recordings that Curtis made, and you can listen to those um, online at the Library of Congress. Um, but we don't have any um, recordings for sale in the museum. We do have some Native American um, authored books for sale in our museum, including um, comic book sort of retelling of uh, the traditional folklore of some of the tribes. Um, we do have some jewelry uh, for sale made by um, some of the seminal, uh, seminal tribal earrings for sale. And we do have a really beautiful display, educational display of the Seminole tribe patchwork and some photography, um, which strikes, of course, a little closer to home than Curtis in his Northwest coast. Yeah. Any other questions for us this evening? Well, I really want to thank you all for joining us. Um, again, please make sure you come and visit us at the museum. Um, we are one of the safest places to be um, during our COVID pandemic. Um, as a quick reminder, masks are required at all times. We do have hand sanitizing stations um, and lots of social distancing markers throughout the museum to keep all of you safe. Um, and we do hope that you can come and visit us and see these exhibitions. Our curatorial team has done a beautiful job in, in displaying these and we're very proud um, to, to have these works on view. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Again, this will be put up on our YouTube site um, tomorrow afternoon. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free. Always give us a phone call or send us an email, reach out, and we're here. And I hope all of you have a wonderful evening. Stay safe, uh, stay healthy, and we'll see you at the museum soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye.